I wish to welcome you to this virtual class. In this class, we're going to talk about the female reproductive system. You realize that this is part of the lecture series of reproductive systems. We have already talked about the male reproductive system. And so this part two, we talk about the female reproductive system. And in part three, I talk about development and congenital malformations of the reproductive systems. So in this lecture of female reproductive system, we largely focus on the physio anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive system in the absence of pregnancy. So that non-gravid state is what we focus on largely. And uh, this will be our objective in this class. We will first outline the components of the female reproductive system. Then we'll talk about what we call the female external genitalia. That will be one of the components we're going to outline. And so in the female external genitalia, we look at the anatomy and role of the female external genitalia, which is also called the vulva. We'll then look at the anatomy and role of the perineum. When you are talking about the female external genitalia, we'll define what is perineum and we'll talk about its role. Then, as with regard to the female internal genitalia, we'll talk about the structure and role of the female gonad, which is the ovary. We'll also talk about at that point, the hormonal axis that controls the female functions. We call it the hypothalamus, hypophysial ovarian hormonal axis. We'll then look at the ovarian phases during the female productive cycle. In each cycle, what are the ovarian phases? We'll then look at the female reproductive tract, we look at the organs that form the tract and we describe them. One of them is the uterus and at that point then we'll also talk about the endometrial phases. These are the changes which occur in the uterus during a particular physiological cycle in a woman. And we'll finish with the, the physiology of female sexual response. So let's just go straight to the first key agenda, which is the anatomy, sorry, which is the components of the female productive system, just outlining the components. We can divide the components of the female reproductive system into three. We have the female external genitalia, we have the female internal genitalia, and we have the female accessory wow. organ of reproduction. When you talk of the female accessory organ of reproduction, we are primarily referring to the female breast. In this lecture, we'll not talk about female breast because we cover that one largely when you're talking about the integument system, where we talk about the appendages of the skin, we tackle the breast quite well, and so you can refer to that lecture another time. So in this lecture, we only focus on the first two, female external genitalia and the female internal genitalia. So that means that our first agenda is gone. So now let's look at what makes up the female external genitalia. When you talk of the female external genitalia, we are talking about the vulva. So basically, this is what we see from outside. So what are the components of the vulva? We have this raised part, which we call the mons pubis. The mons pubis is that raised part above the pubic symphysis. Usually this part is raised because it has some fat tissue just beneath the skin there that makes it raised. That raising largely become more prominent from the age of puberty. 
And of course, we know that there's some hair on top of the mons pubis. The primary role of the mons pubis is to provide cushioning during sexual intercourse. So basically, it dampens the physical impact that uh, may be there during sexual intercourse. Radiating from either side of the mons pubis are these large folds, which we call the labia majora. The primary role of the labia majora is basically to protect the vulva. And we can compare the labia majora to the scrotum in males. So the labia majora are synonymous to the scrotum in males. In males, we have the scrotum, which are fused as a result of virilization caused by the androgens during development. In females, the labia majora are not fused. They are separated, but they are longitudinally stretched. So they are elongated in the longitudinal aspect. The two labia majora meet posteriorly at that point, which we call the posterior labio commissure. Just like the way the scrotum has something in it that connect it to the abdomen, and that is the spermatic cord. In females, there's a ligament that is synonymous to the spermatic cord. We call it the round ligament of the uterus. This round ligament of the uterus attaches the labia majora to the uterus. It also passes through the inguinal canal. Okay, then this is the clitoris. So that the clitoris, the primary role of the clitoris is that uh, for sexual stimulation. So you have some nerve terminals that facilitate sexual stimulation when it's rubbed or massaged, there's some sexual stimulation that gives to the woman. Radiating from either side of the clitoris are these other folds, which we call labia minora. So that's labia minora, that's also labia minora. The two labia minora meet posteriorly at that point there that we call the frenulum of the labia. Now, the two labia minora enclose a region here. And the region enclosed by the two labia minora is what we call the vestibule. Into the vestibule are some openings. We have opening of the urethra. So we call that urethro opening or urethro meatus. You'll find that one at around 12 o'clock position. We also have the opening of the vagina and it's unmistakable down here. So that's the vaginal opening or what we call the introitus. But those are not the only openings in the vestibule as someone may want to think. There are some glands which we call the Bartholin's glands or other is known as the greater vestibular glands or the glands of Bartholin. These glands open on either side of the vaginal opening and slightly down. If you are to go with o'clock position, then we'll say about five and seven o'clock position. So we have openings of the greater vestibular glands, which are known as the glands of Bartholin at around that position. These glands produce a lubricant during coitus that help to lubricate the introitus during coitus. We also have openings of the skin's glands. Usually they are on either side of the urethra and so that's why we call them paraurethral glands. So they open on either side of the urethra. So basically, those are the openings which are in the vestibule. Remember, the vestibule is protected by the labia minora. <laughs> 
the labia minora is actually synonymous to the penal urethra in males, except again, because of virilization in males, the penal urethra is fused and incorporated in the penis. In females, the labia minora are not fused. They are separated and the gap between them is what we call the vestibule. So we've already talked about the urethrometers, which is at 12 o'clock position. We've talked about the introitus, which is that one. And uh, we've already talked about the posterior labial commissure, the junction between the right and left labia majora. We realize that beyond that, then we'll be going towards the side of the anal canal. So basically, this is the valve or the external genitalia of female. So then while we are at the female external genitalia, it is important we talk about the perineum. By definition, the perineum is a diamond-shaped place in the lower part of the trunk diamond-shaped space or region in the lower part of the trunk. And in this image, we are seeing the diamond. What are the boundaries of the diamond? So here we have the pubic symphysis. And here we have the cossex. In this corner, we have the ischial tuberosity, so the right and the left ischial tuberosity. So connecting the pubic symphysis to the ischial tuberosity, or basically connecting the pubic bone to the ischial bone, is this part of the, of the pelvis, which we call the ischial pubic cremus. So the anterolateral boundary, bony, the anterolateral bony boundary of the perineum is the ischial pubic ramus. The anterior most boundary of the perineum is the pubic symphysis or the pubic bone itself. The posterior most boundary, posterior most bony boundary of the perineum is the cossix and sacrum, we can say so. The posterior lateral boundary is considered to be a ligament that connect the bony, the posterior bony structure and the pubic and the ischia tuberosity. And that's this ligament. We call it the sacrotuberous ligament. So let me say that again in an easier way. Anteriorly, the pubic bone and pubic symphysis. Anterolaterally, is your pubic cremus. Laterally, the ischium and ischial tuberosity itself. Posterolaterally, sacrotuberous ligament, and posteriorly, the sacrum and cossex. So that is the perineum. This perineum functions as a pelvic outlet. So it is the outlet from the pelvis. And I want you to understand that whether male or female, they both have a perineum. The perineum that we've described is divided into two triangles using an imaginary line that join the two issue tuberosities as we can see in that dotted line. So this dotted line divides the anatomical perineum into two triangles. There's this anterior triangle and then this posterior triangle. The anterior triangle is termed the urogenital triangle and the posterior triangle is termed the anorectal triangle. I want us to look at these two triangles, both of them, and see what is contained within them. We start with the urogenital triangle, which is the anterior triangle. 
So the Irugento Tango is basically the region of the perineum that houses the external genitalia. And as I've mentioned, this external genitalia can be both of the male as well as of the female. So we give it that name based on the fact that the external genitalia houses the components of the reproductive as well as urinary systems. Whether it's male or female, it houses the external genitalia. So the female external genitalia is in the urogenital tangle. The male external genitalia is also in the urogenital tangle. These images try to appreciate, help us to appreciate that concept that we've just highlighted so far. So the image to your left shows you the urogenital tango in female containing the components of the external genitalia. And the image on your right shows you male and how the urogenital tango contain at least the root of the penis, which is part of the male external genitalia. The posterior tangle is what we call the anorectal tangle. The posterior tangle houses the external anal sphincter, as well as what we call the ischiorectal fossa. So the external anal sphincter is this one, the muscle that contain, control the anus. And then this region here usually is a potential space filled with fat. That's what we call the ischiorectal fossa. Maybe these images will make it better. These coronal images will make it better. So the anal sphincter refers to the muscle that control the anus. Usually there are two types of anal sphincters. We have the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is largely smooth muscle and it's a thickening of the circular layer of the muscularis propria of the GIT at the level of the rectum. So that internal anal sphincter is of smooth muscle, which means it is involuntary. You don't have conscious control over it. And so it's under autonomic innervation. Remember, it's just a thickening of the circular layer of the muscularis propria of the GIT at the level of the rectum and anus, of course, because of the junction there. The external anal sphincter is the one that is categorically within the triangle. The external anal sphincter is made up of skeletal muscles. This external anal sphincter is there for voluntary, which means you have conscious control over it. You can tighten it. If you don't want gas or stool to pass, you can relax it voluntarily if you want any of those two to pass. So this external anal sphincter has three parts. There's a part of it that's deep. And there's a part of it that we call superficial, which is that one. And there's a part of it that we call subcutaneous. So we have the subcutaneous part, superficial part, and the deep part. And those names just suggest how far they are from the surface anyway. So I think it's easier to understand that. OK, so that is the anal sphincter. Remember, it's voluntary, so it's under somatic innervation. So this other image shows us a cross-section through the anal sphincter again this being part of the internal sphincter and this being part of the external sphincter. External to the sphincter, we see a region made up of adipose tissue, and that is what we are calling the ischiorectal fossa. We call it ischiorectal fossa because this is the ischium there and this is rectum, so it's a depression between the two parts. <clears throat> 
usually filled with fat. The ischorectophores are sites of accumulation of pus sometimes in what we call perianal abscesses, quite common site for accumulation of pus when you have infections around this region. You may have pus accumulating those region. Those are perianal abscesses. So fair enough, that is the anatomy of the perineum. And so that summarizes what I wanted to say about female external genitalia. And remember, we took a detour to just talk about the perineum as well so that we clear the air. So now let's talk about the female internal genitalia. When you talk of female internal genitalia, we are referring to two category of structures. The first category is the female gonad, which we call the ovary. And the second category is the female reproductive tract, which refers to the path followed by either, depending on how you look at it, the oocyte or the sperms, depending on how you look at it. So basically the channel. And so this channel consists of the vaginal canal. If you follow the path of the sperms, then vaginal canal, cervix, then the rest of the uterus, then fallopian tube. Remember cervix is basically part of the uterus, but we prefer mentioning it independently many times. So, Having said so, I want us to look at the female internal genitalia, but let's start with the ovary. So the ovary is located on either side of the uterus. The structures which are located on either side of the uterus are usually referred to as uterine adnexa. And so the ovary is part of the uterine adnexa. The ovary is suspended within the brown ligament of the uterus. Well, if we look at this image, we are able to appreciate that. So this is the uterus, and this is what we call the broad ligament of the uterus, and this is the ovary. Two other things hold it there. We have the utero ovarian ligament, which is a fold, and we also have what we call the suspensory ligament of the ovary. This one at least makes it be suspended up a bit so that it's not redundant, it goes down. This other part is what we call the mesovarium, basically means the mesentery of the ovary. And also mesosulfings, the mesentery of the fallopian tube. What are the key functions of the ovary? Two key functions of the ovary, production of the oocyte, that's what we call oogenesis, and uh, production of hormones in particular, estrogen and progesterone. So in terms of its structure, this is the ovary. Uh, we have the outer covering of the ovary, which we call the ovarian capsule. I'll be showing you a better image of that. Then deep to it, we have the ovarian cortex, which contain ovarian follicles at different stages of maturation. And within it, we have the ovarian medulla, which contain blood vessels and the rest of connective tissue system of the ovary. So remember, the cortex is the one that contain the follicles at different stages of maturation. And the medulla contain blood vessels and connective tissue elements. Perhaps this is a better histology slide of the ovary to just help us capture that as well. So this is the ovarian cortex, which contain ovarian follicles at different stages of maturation. We'll be shortly looking at those maturation steps of the oocyte. The central part is the ovarian medulla, which contain connective tissue, stroma, and the blood vessels. A higher magnification of that is here. So this is the cortex which contain 
follicles at different stages of maturation. And this is the medulla, which contain connective tissue elements and blood vessels. I want us to pay, however, some attention to the outer covering of the ovary. The outer covering of the ovary is known as the ovarian capsule. And this is a high magnification of the ovarian capsule to show us what it's really made up of. The ovarian capsule is made up of two things. A thick layer of connective tissue, this one I'm pointing at, which we call the tunica albuginea. But external to the tunica albuginea, you know something very interesting. We see a simple cuboidal epithelial lining on the surface of the tunica albuginea. That simple cuboidal epithelial lining on the surface of the tunica albuginea is termed the germinal epithelium. That is a misnomer though, because it was initially thought that this is where the eggs were coming from. And so it was called the germinal epithelium. We now know better, but the name has, retained, has been retained either way. So the germinal epithelium refers to the simple cuboidal epithelial lining on the ovary that covers the tunica albuginea of the ovary. The tunica albuginea is a thick connective tissue layer that covers the ovary. The two, tunica albuginea and germinal epithelium constitute the ovarian capsule. Then deep to it, we have the ovarian cortex, which contain ovarian follicles at different stages of maturation. Apart from the ovarian follicles, the cortex also contain the stromal cells of the ovary. So we've mentioned that one of the key functions of the ovary is eugenesis. Just a reminder about the fact that, uh, about the story of eugenesis, remember it occurs in the ovarian cortex. The process of forming the oocyte begins before the girl child is born, but it becomes arrested at process one and can only be undone several years later after puberty in style. And so it takes several years to form a single oocyte. Some oocytes may take 15 years to be formed, some may take 45 years to be formed. The process of eugenesis enters at menopause, and menopause is defined as cessation of menstrual flow for at least one year. It occurs at around the age of 49 years. We know that the process of forming the oocyte is cyclic. So every month, about 15 to 20 oocytes are recruited to continue in their development, although in most of the time, only one will succeed. The oocyte is supported by some cells. The cells that support the developing oocytes are known as the follicular cells and the granulosa cells. We tend to use the term follicular if they are squamous and the granulosa ones if they are cuboidal and especially in the stratified context. So maybe just to familiarize with that, <laughs> that the developing oocyte, as the oocyte develops, the one that has been recruited, as it develops, it is surrounded by supporting cells. I've already told you that the term follicular is preferred when they're squamous and granulosa, when they're cuboidal, and especially when they're stratified cuboidal from this stage onwards. There's usually something that cover the oocyte. We call that something the zona pellucida. It's a glycoprotein material that separates the supporting cells from the oocyte. This zona pellucida is important in many ways. One, we can say that it prevents polyspermy fertilization by more than one sperm. Usually when a sperm enters the oocyte, the zona pellucida hardens so that another sperm cannot enter. That's what we call polyspermy. But we also know that the zona pellucida usually only allows the sperm a sperm of the same species as that of the oocyte to cross it, which means that zona pellucida offers some level of species specificity. 
we can also say that there's an policy that protects the oocyte. And especially having in mind that we know that the oocyte is going to stay for long, many years. And so we need something to protect the oocyte so that we don't have a lot of genetic alteration of the oocyte during the years. But that does not mean again that we have 100% protection, no. And that's why we also say that uh, genetic disorders increase with increasing maternal age. The whole complex of the supporting cells, the zona pellucida and the oocyte itself is what we are calling the ovarian follicle. And these are the ones we are saying that they are usually recruited every month after the age of puberty. And so in the recruitment process, we see the follicles developing. So from your left, that's the most primitive one, which we call the primordial follicle. And the ones in the middle are primary follicles. And the one at the end, there is an antro follicle, almost maturing, so that can be ovulated. We'll be talking about the different types of follicles shortly. The number of ovarian follicles, however, changes significantly during the years of a woman. Usually, a number of them undergo atresia. Even before the girl child is born, quite a number, and even after birth, quite a number undergo atresia. Maybe just to remind you that at the beginning, there are about 7 million or slightly less than that one. And this is what we have at the beginning prenatally before the girl child is born. However, by the time the girl child is being born, millions of the follicles will have already undergone atresia. And by the time she's being born, she has less than 1 million at birth. This less than 1 million at birth, still many of them undergo atresia between the time of birth and the time the woman reaches puberty. Many of them undergo atresia. And by the time she's reaching puberty, she has less than 50,000 in her ovary. Well, it sounds like uh, those ones are quite little, but let's say this again. When she starts puberty, about 15 to 20 will be recruited every month. Out of these 15 to 20, not all of them will succeed, definitely. As a matter of fact, majority of them don't succeed. In most cases, only one or a few will succeed. The ones that don't succeed, what happened to them? Again, they undergo atresia every month. So that sounds like we are really losing them. But if you look at it carefully, you realize that a woman doesn't actually need all those 7 million. As a matter of fact, if this woman was to ovulate every month in all the years of her reproductive cycle, which may not be practical as well, then it means that she has about 40 years of ovulation. If let's say she started ovulating at the age of 10 and finished at the age of 50, so 40 years of ovulation, multiply that by 12, you're going to less to have less than 500 anyway. Well, a woman doesn't need 500 children, and so it's still enough, so to speak. While we are talking about the ovary, let's talk about the hormonal axis that control the female reproductive cycle. We call this hormonal axis the hypothalamus hypophysial ovarian hormonal axis. So the story begins this way. We have hypothalamus. Hypothalamus produces a hormone which goes to the anterior pituitary gland. The name given to the anterior pituitary gland is the adenohypophysis. The hormone that comes from hypothalamus to the adenohypophysis in the context of hypothalamus hypophysial ovarian axis, that hormone is the 
GNRH, which stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. Why do we call it so? We call it so because it promotes the release of gonadotropic hormones. And why do we call them gonadotropic hormones? Because these hormones are tropic stimulatory to the gonads. In this case, the gonad is the ovary. So they are tropic, they are stimulatory to the ovary. There are two gonadotropic hormones, the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. They both come from adenohypophysis in response to GnRH, which come from hypothalamus. So FSH and LH will act on the ovary in this case. As the name suggests, FSH promotes follicular maturation or follicular development. That recruitment process of about 15 to 20 being recruited every month, that's what we mean. FSH facilitate that process and make try to make the follicles continue to grow. As the follicle becomes bigger, it produces more and more estrogen. And so we can say therefore that FSH also stimulate the secretion of estrogen hormone from the ovary. On the other hand, luteinizing hormone is usually at high levels around the time of ovulation. And so we associate this luteinizing hormone surge with ovulation. After ovulation, the cells of the follicle tend to produce more progesterone than estrogen. And there's link to that aspect, luteinizing hormone stimulating the secretion of progesterone. So these are the overall components of the hypothalamus hypophysial ovarian hormonal axis. And this hormonal axis is the one that controls the female productive cycles. The gonadotropic hormones control the ovarian phases. So FSH and LH control the ovarian phases predominantly. And then estrogen and progesterone control the endometrial phases. So therefore, because you're talking about the ovary and we've just talked about the hormonal axis of the ovary, hormonal axis of female, sorry, let's now talk about the changes that take place in the ovary during a particular physiological month. We'll want to look at the ovarian phases. So there are three ovarian phases we are going to describe. The first phase is the follicular phase. The follicular phase begins around the first day of each cycle. And remember, first day is usually marked by the menstrual flow. The first day of the menstrual flow is what you call the first day. So I'm saying that when that is happening, when the flow is beginning in a particular month in female, that particular time when the flow is beginning in the uterus, there is something that's also happening in the ovary. The ovary begins the follicular phase. The follicular phase is characterized by recruitment, growth, and development of the ovarian follicles. Those about 15 to 20, which are recruited every month, that's what happened at this time. So the follicles will grow, they'll be recruited, they'll grow, they increase in size. This is largely caused by that rise in the levels of FSH at the beginning of the cycle. And that's why therefore we have follicular development because this is follicle stimulating hormone. But we know that as the levels of follicle stimulating hormone arise, 
the number of supporting cells increase. And as the number of supporting cells increase, the supporting cells release a lot of estrogen. And so the levels of estrogen increase. Therefore, we can link the follicular phase of the ovary to estrogen. And so we also call the estrogen phase. Well, it's not called estrogen phase largely because, not necessarily because there is high levels of estrogen, but also because this estrogen also actually acts on the follicle to also facilitate follicular maturation. So estrogen is also important in follicular maturation in addition to FSH. As the levels of estrogen rise in the early follicular phase, there's a negative feedback on the axis. That negative feedback causes deficiency or a reduction in the production of FSH. Unfortunately, smaller follicles are usually FSH dependent. And so if we have a reduction in FSH levels, it means that the smaller follicles are going to suffer. Actually, they undergo atresia. So that, remember, this is still early follicular phase. The smaller follicles undergo atresia. Why? Because we have FSH deficiency. Why do we have FSH deficiency? Because we have a rise in the levels of estrogen, and that has caused a negative feedback onto the hypothalamus, hypophysial ovarian hormonal axis. And so we have reduction in the production of FSH as a result of negative feedback. The larger follicles are usually FSH independent. They rely largely on the estrogen that they're producing to continue to grow. And so they're not affected by the reduction, the levels of FSH. And so those larger follicles will most likely continue to grow. The largest of them all will be termed the dominant follicle or the leading follicle. Okay, so let's name the different types of the ovarian follicles at this stage. We've mentioned that the ovary has a cortex and a medulla and that the follicles are present in the ovarian cortex, which is here. So that's the ovarian cortex, that's the ovarian capsule, and this ovarian medulla. We want to see the different types of follicles within the ovarian cortex. The most primitive form of the follicles is what we call the primordial follicle. They look like this. They tend to exist in groups and they are just subcapsular. Primordial follicles consist of the oocyte, usually primary oocyte, surrounded by one layer of squamous cells. The one layer of squamous cells is what we are calling follicular cells. So when these primordial follicles are recruited and they continue to grow, they form the primary follicles. So you won't have many primary follicles compared to the primordial follicles. But uh, let's assume you have about 15 to 20. So primary follicles look like this. They are surrounded by cuboidal cells instead of squamous cells. We can also see some differences here. The size of the oocyte has increased. We can also see that the primary follicles are quite slightly away from the capsule and that they're not existing in groups. There are different types of primary follicles though. They are those primary follicles which have only one layer of cuboidal cells. So we call them unilamina primary follicles. But there are those that may have more than one layer of cuboidal cells and perhaps these ones or a better one would be this one. And that's what we call the multilamina primary follicle. They're all primary follicles as long as they're surrounded by cuboidal cells and they don't have 
an antrum. When they develop an antrum like this one, then we don't call them primary follicles, we call them antral follicle. So we use the term antral follicle to refer to the follicle that contain antrum. The antrum is that fluid spill space. Of course, the antral follicle will be larger than a primary follicle because the number of cells are increasing. So we may have many antral follicles at different stages of maturation. Again, some, the, the antrum is just forming some the antrum has formed, but uh, still small, and others the antrum is actually very prominent. So we can use the term secondary follicles again to refer to these antral follicles. As development continues, the size of the antrum continues as well. And as that happens, the follicle try to move toward the surface of the ovary. The follicle that moves to the surface of the ovary and ready for ovulation is termed the mature follicle. So this is a mature follicle. You are not seeing the oocyte, not because it lacks, but because of the sectioning. Otherwise, they all have that. How do we know the mature follicle from the, the others? Usually the mature follicle will have the largest antrum. It will also be the one that is on the surface and indeed even protruding slightly onto the variant surface. We call that protrusion the stigma. So the follicle that has the stigma is the mature follicle, which is also known as the graphene follicle. So those are the different types of ovarian follicles. Remember, this developmental process of the follicles from the primordial follicles to the mature follicle take place during the follicular phase of development and is facilitated by FSH as well as estrogen and so we call that the estrogen phase. Remember during the early follicular phase the levels of estrogen that were rising caused some negative feedback onto the axis and that led to reduction in production of FSH. And that is what causes the other follicles to undergo atresia. But the larger follicles will continue to develop. The late follicular phase is characterized by something else that I'm going to de describe as we talk about the ovulatory phase. But before we talk about the bilateral phase, let's talk about the parts of an antral follicle. So what is labeled A is the oocyte, because this is just before relation, let's say so, then that oocyte would be a secondary oocyte as opposed to a primary oocyte. A primary oocyte is an oocyte that has not completed the first meiotic division. A secondary oocyte is an oocyte that has completed the second meiotic division. So these are secondary oocyte because we believe that maybe this, oocyte, this follicle is almost being ovulated. And so most likely second meiotic division is complete. That does not mean that all secondary oocytes must have, that does not mean that all antral follicles must have a secondary oocyte. It may still be primary oocyte. So the concept here is that that's the oocyte. The one level B is a zona pellucida. We've already elaborated on the function of the zona pellucida. The one level C is the basement membrane. Remember the granulosa cells are basically epithelial cells and that means that they need epithelial basement membrane to rest on. There are different populations of granulosa cells around this time for them to be particular. The population of granulosa cells immediately external to the zona pellucida, these ones are known as the corona radiata. The population of follicle of granulosa cells which suspend the oocyte into the antrum this population of granulosa cells 
are known as the cumulus euphorus. And lastly, we have the population of granulosa cells external to the antrum. This population of granulosa cells is what we call the stratum granulosum. Of course, this is the follicular antrum. That is the part filled with cavity with fluid. That's a fluid filled cavity. That's the follicular antrum. And this other antrum continue to increase as the follicle matures. So this is the stratum granulosum. The cells of the ovary, the stromal cells of the ovary external to the follicle exist in two populations, but collectively we call that the thicker folliculi. The internal population of thicker folliculi consists of cellular layer, the stromal cells of the ovary. This cellular layer is termed the thicker interna. The outer zone of the thicker follicle consists of fibrous tissue. We call it the thicker externa. So this is the antrofollicle. When ovulation takes place, this is the part that is ovulated. The rest of the follicle remain in the ovary, but only this part will be ovulated. That part of the follicle that remains in the ovary is what is termed the corpus luteum. So this image shows you that this is the part that will be ovulated and the rest will remain in the ovary as the corpus luteum. So at this point, let's talk about the ovulatory phase of the ovary. The ovulatory phase is that period when now the oocyte is being released from the ovary. How does it happen? When the follicle is developing, in the late follicular phase, the levels of estrogen are really high. Why? Because the follicle is very big. And so the amount of estrogen that come from the big follicles is really a lot. Estrogen has one important role among its many roles. It has one important role on the pituitary axis. It causes an upsurge in the GnRH receptors. What does that mean? It increases the density of receptors of gonadotropin releasing hormone. Remember the receptors of gonadotropin releasing hormone are in the pituitary gland. If the density of the receptors increase, it means that even small amount of GnRH that come from hypothalamus will give us massive physiological effects in terms of production of the gonadotropic hormones. So estrogen increases the sensitivity of the pituitary gland to GnRH. And that leads to high levels of production of the gonadotropic hormones. We have an upsurge in FSH and LH. Remember, this happens in the late follicular phase, just before ovulation. We have an upsurge in FSH and LH. What do we call that? That's an example of a positive feedback mechanism. High levels of estrogen have caused even further high levels of production of FSH and LH. That's a positive feedback mechanism. Now, not the negative feedback mechanism that characterized the early follicular phase. The surge in the gonadotropic hormones, as you can see in this one. So look at that, rising levels of estrogen, we call that 
estrogen phase, when the levels of estrogen are high there, it causes positive feedback mechanism on the axis, and that leads to a surge in the production of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. The surge in the gonadotropic hormones, especially the surge in luteinizing hormone, is the one that will cause production of progesterone hormone. The increased production of progesterone hormone lead to triggering some molecular mechanisms that lead to extrusion of the egg from the ovary. I don't wish to go to the molecular mechanisms that lead to the extrusion of the egg from the ovary, but in a nutshell, it will involve some enzyme production that break down collagen, also some accumulation of prostaglandins, and even fluid accumulation within the antrum that will lead to swelling of the antrum. Eventually, we'll have rupture. And so the oocyte will be extruded from the ovary in that process called ovulation. After the oocyte has been extruded from the ovary, we mentioned that only the oocyte zona pellucida and corona radiata are extruded. The parts of the follicle that remain in the ovary, the, granulos the stratum granulosum and the thicker folliculi will become the corpus luteum. Okay, that then leads us to the luteal phase. The luteal phase is that period when now the ovary has the corpus luteum. We explain the luteal phase this way. Remember during ovulation, there was luteinizing hormone surge. The surge in the luteinizing hormone, among many of its effects, causes what we call luteinization of the follicle. When the follicle undergoes luteinization, the remnants of the follicle which were there are granulosa cells and the thicker folliculi. The granulosa cells transform to be called the granulosa lutein cells and the thicker internal cells transform to be called the thicker lutein cells. This population of cells are largely responsible for production of progesterone hormone. Usually what happens is that the thicker lutein will produce androgens. Then those androgens are converted by the granulosa lutein cells into progesterone. So we have progesterone production. Instead of high levels of estrogen production, now we have high levels of progesterone production. It is for that reason that the luteal phase is termed the progesterone phase because this period is characterized by high levels of progesterone production. The corpus luteum, however, does not last forever. It is known to last for about two weeks, and then it involutes if there's no pregnancy. If there is pregnancy, there must be something that will trigger it to persist, and that's what we call the HCG, human chorionigonadotropin, so that the corpus luteum can continue producing progesterone. But if there's no pregnancy, there is no HCG, corpus luteum involutes, and that means what? That its hormonal function also decline. We know that the luteal phase is relatively fixed at around 11 to 14 days, as opposed to the estrogen phase or the follicular phase that is highly variable. And so a woman who has variable cycles or a woman who does not necessarily have 28 day cycle, the phase that is more subject to change is the first phase of the cycle, the estrogen phase, as opposed to the last phase of the cycle, the progesterone phase. That information is important when you are advising a couple 
that are plan planning to conceive or are planning not to conceive. Your advice based on the dating method or the maximizing method will be largely also based on the, your knowledge of the fact that the luteal phase is relatively fixed. That will help you to estimate the timing, or let me say the correct timing or the most appropriate timing of ovulation. Okay, so those are the phases of the ovary. Now I want us to talk about the female reproductive tract. Remember we mentioned that the female internal genitalia consists of the ovary and the female reproductive tract. We've already talked about the ovary, we looked at the structure, the function of the ovary, and while we're there, we looked at the hormonal axis and we also looked at the ovarian phases. Now, I want us to look at the component of the female reproductive tract. One of the components of the female reproductive tract is the fallopian tube, as we had mentioned earlier. Fallopian tube is just a muscular tube lined by simple columnar ciliated epithelium. This muscular tube connects the ovaries to the uterus. It doesn't quite have strong anatomic connection with the ovary, not really. It is suspended just over the ovary, but at least it is continuous with the fallopian tube. It's continuous with the uterus. So the ovarian end of the fallopian tube opens into the peritoneal cavity. When ovulation takes place, the egg is also released into that peritoneal cavity. Then it's the role of the fallopian tube to fish the egg. It's important that we know the parts of the fallopian tube. So I hope you do remember that this is what we call the fimbria. This is the part that fishes the egg after ovulation. Then we have this, the funnily shaped part is called the infundibulum. This long region is what we call the ampulla. The ampulla is where fertilization takes place. The isthmus, this narrow part of the fallopian tube. And then there's that part of the fallopian tube that is traversing the uterine wall. We call it the intramural segment or the interstitial segment of the fallopian tube. So we have those five parts of the fallopian tube. Histologically, this is how fallopian tube looks like. Well, depending on the region that has been sectioned, you may see different patterns, but in overall, you have a tube that has extensive mucosal folds. Even this one shows a tube with extensive mucosal folds. The inner lining is highly folded, extensive mucosal folds. These are the mucosal folds, as we can see, very extensive. And we can see many levels of folds. You can see a primary fold, you can see a secondary fold, you can see a tertiary fold. The wall of the tube itself contain an inner circular layer of smooth muscle and, and an outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle, as we can see here. So this is the outer longitudinal. This is inner circular layer of smooth muscle. That is adventition. The outside is the mucosa, the inside. We can appreciate that the mucosa is made up of simple column epithelium. There are two types of cells in the mucosa. There are these ones which look like this. We call them the ciliated cells or ciliated columnar cells. They are the ones with cilia, and these cilia help to propel the oocyte or the conceptus from the fimbrial end towards the uterine end of the fallopian tube. But you also have cells which look like this. We call them PEG cells, P-E-G, 
peg cells or that one peg cells or this one peg cell compare with that one ciliated columnar cell the peg cells are secretory cells so they provide secretions the secretions of the peg cells are rich in glycogen so they are nutrient rich secretions which come from the peg cells the idea is that uh, the nutrient will nourish the conceptors in the event that fertilization takes place in the fallopian tube. Remember that the conceptors will take some days before it reaches the uterus, actually about four to five days. So we can now summarize the functions of the fallopian tube. One, transport of gametes. The gamete you're talking about here are both the oocyte as well as the sperm, except that direction be different. So the oocyte is transported towards the direction, facilitated by the contraction of the fallopian tube and the ciliary activity of the fallopian tube, as well as the secretions actually within the fallopian tube. The sperm is transported this way. The sperm transport largely relies on the motility of the sperm and the contractions of the fallopian tube. The ciliary activity of the fallopian tube is against sperm transport, but it promotes oocyte transport or the transport of the conceptors if fertilization takes place. We also know that the fallopian tube is a site of fertilization. Fertilization in particular takes place within the ampule of the fallopian tube. And we also know that the fallopian tube is a site of early embryonic development. If fertilization takes place in the ampulla, the conceptors will still have to move for some days before it reaches the endometrial cavity, the appropriate site of implantation. And so for the first four or five days, the conceptors will be in the fallopian tube being nourished by the fallopian tube. Okay, now we can talk about the second component of the female reproductive tract, and that is the uterus. So this is how the uterus looks like. Let's start by looking at the gross parts of the uterus. We call that the fundus of the uterus, which is that one. We call this the body of the uterus, which is that one. And we call this the cervix, which is better here. Those are, however, not the only part of the uterus I want you to know. There are two others that I want you to know. The junction between the body and the cervix of the uterus around that region, that narrow part, is called the isthmus of the uterus. It means narrow isthmus of the uterus. Don't confuse isthmus of the uterus with isthmus of the fallopian tube. Same spelling, but of course, refer to different things. So remember the isthmus of the uterus. I also want to remember this point of the uterus, which you call the corners of the uterus, C-O-R-N-U-S. Corners means a horn. So this is the right uterine horn, and that's the left uterine horn the right uterine corners, conu or corners, and this is the left conu. So we have those five gross anatomical parts of the uterus. Of course, with regard to the cavity, that is the endometrial cavity, and that the cervical canal. The upper opening of the cervical canal is the internal os, the lower opening of the cervical canal is the external os. On either side of the uterus, we have this, what you call the uterine adnexa. When you talk of uterine adnexa, we're largely referring to the broad ligament and its parts. We are referring to the ovary and we are referring to the fallopian tube. Those are the principal components of the uterus at Nexa, the things on either side of the uterus. How is the uterus positioned 
within the pelvis. The normal position of the uterus is described as anteverted, anteflexed. So here we need to understand what is uterine version and what is uterine flexion. Let's use these images here to explain, help us understand what is uterine version and what is uterine flexion. Uterine version refers to the angulation between the long axis of the vagina and the long axis of the cervix. The angulation between the axis of the vagina and the axis of the cervix. That angulation is what you're calling the angle of uterine version. So we can use the term anteverted, which is the normal one, which means that the angle is folding forwards, the uterus is folding forwards. So it makes it almost at 90 degrees there. But we can also use the term retroverted if this cervix was falling backwards so that that angle is more obtuse. It doesn't have to reach 180 or beyond, but when it is more obtuse, we call that retroverted uterus. So that is the uterine version, the angulation between the long axis of the cervix and the long axis of the vagina. We can have antiversion, which is the normal one, we can have retroversion, which is not the best one to have, but some people may still have it. And I'll say why it's not the best one to have shortly. But let's now define uterine flexion. Uterine flexion refers to the angulation between the long axis of the cervix and the long axis of the uterine body that is uterine flexion. So if the body is tilted forwards in respect to the long axis of the cervix, then we say the uterus is anteflexed. If the uterus is, uterine body is tilted backwards with respect to the long axis of the cervix, then we say that uterus is retroflexed. So don't confuse the uterine flexion and uterine version. But the normal state is that the uterus is anteverted, which means the cervix is tilted forward significantly with respect to the long axis of the vagina. And the uterus is anteflex, which means the uterine body is tilted forward with respect to the long axis of the cervix. So this shows us an anteverted, anteflexed uterus. What advantage does that type of uterus have on uterine stability? If the uterus was not going to be tilted forwards on those two angles, then the weight of the uterus will be falling somewhere here. That means that the uterus will be exerting all its weight or most of its weight along the vaginal canal that uterus will be at high risk of prolapsing through the vagina because the weight of the uterus will be along the axis of the vagina. So antiversion, antiflexion is advantageous in the sense that it brings the weight of the uterus to be on the urinary bladder. And so that that uterus is therefore supported by the urinary bladder as opposed to it being exerting its weight along the vagina. To maintain its position in that level, that's why now we now have the round ligament of the uterus, which attaches it to the labia majora. So the role of the round ligament of the uterus is to maintain, to help the uterus maintain 
the antiverted and the flexed position, which is vital for uterine stability. And so this antiverted and flexed position is very key in uterine stability. It ensures that the weight of the uterus is on top of the urinary bladder, as opposed to along the vagina. Well, the other key stability of the uterus is basically the muscles on the pelvic floor. You can call that pelvic diaphragm. It's also a very strong stability factor of the uterus. If you have weakness in the pelvic floor of a woman, then the uterus can also fall down. Remember the pelvic floor now hold all the organs of the female pelvis intact, including the blood itself. So you can imagine if it's weak, then the organs of the pelvic floor will be affected, including the bladder. What are the relations of the uterus? I want you to figure this out. Maybe at your own time, look at, so which organs are in front? You'll see the bladder there. Which organs are behind? You'll see the rectum there and this space here. We call the pouch of Douglas. This pouch of Douglas is a potential space, but usually within here, you may have the sigmoid colon falling there or the small intestines falling there. So those are still posterior relation to the uterus. Inferiorly, you can see the vagina and superiorly, we expect the coils of the small intestine as well as the coils of sigmoid colon also on top. And laterally, we have what we call the adnexa, the ovary, the round, sorry, the broad ligament, the fallopian tube, but there's something I want to add as a lateral relation. That's the urinary blood, the ureters, sorry. Ureters are lateral to the uterus. I want to remember that. Look at that again in an atlas and try to appreciate those relations of the uterus. In terms of blood supply to the uterus, there's one main blood supply to the uterus, and that's the uterine artery. It's a branch of the internal iliac artery. It's the main source of blood supply to the uterus, but it's supported by the ovarian artery. The ovarian artery is a branch of the aorta. Takes blood to the ovary, but there's some branches of the ovarian artery that follow the fallopian tube to reach the uterus. So, if you are to mention two arteries that supply the uterus, you have the uterine artery and the ovarian artery. The blood vessels of the uterus go through the wall of the uterus, and they may have different naming systems depending on the level that they are in. You may be aware already, but we're going to talk about the layers of the uterine wall. So the branches of the uterine artery enter into the muscular layer of the uterus, and they form a plexus actually within the muscular layer of the uterus. The arteries which run within the muscular layer of the uterus are known as the aqueate arteries because they arc kind of that layer of the myometrium where they are found is called the stratum vascularis. From the aqueous artery, there's some branches which come out straight into the endometrium. We call them radial arteries because they're given a radial pattern. You know, radial means that there's a centripetal point, then things come out from that particular center. So those are the radial arteries. Then the radial arteries give you some branches which are given off to the stratum basalis of the endometrium. We call those on the straight arteries. The parts of the radial arteries that extend into the stratum functionalis of the endometrium usually coil so much, we call them the spiral arteries. These are the ones that would be affected at some point during menstruation, the spiral arteries. They are highly coiled arteries 
and they extend into the stratum functionalis of the endometrium. Let's talk about the layers between wall. Histologically, there are three layers between wall. The outermost layer is called perimetrium. There's a thin connective tissue layer lined by peritoneal lining. Then the middle layer is called the myometrium. The myometrium is the layer that contain the uterine smooth muscle. Within the myometrium, we have that layer of blood vessels, which we call the stratum functionalis. Sorry, the stratum vascularis, stratum vascularis, the vascular layer of the myometrium. So remember this myometrium is the zone that contain the receptors of oxytocin. And that's why in the influence of oxytocin, the myometrium will contract. And perhaps you know that that's how we manage sometimes bleeding after delivery, where the drug oxytocin will be given to make sure that the myometrium contracts. That contraction will help to collapse the blood vessels, the aquatarteries within the myometrium, the stratum vascularis, the blood vessels there will be collapsed and that will help to control bleeding after delivery. The innermost layer of the uterus is the endometrium, which has two zones, the stratum basalis, that region. This is the one that was containing the radial arteries and the straight arteries branching within it. And stratum functionalis, this one contains several glands. And it's also the one that contains the spiral arteries, the arteries that were coiling highly. When a woman menstruates, the stratum functionalis, the one that shed off during menstruation, the stratum basalis remain. And during implantation, the Conceptors, blastosis comes and implants at that junction. It usually reaches that far, the stratum basalis. The junction between functionalis and basalis, that's the far much that the conceptors reaches during implantation. Right. So these are images of the uterine wall showing us the endometrium there and perhaps the myometrium with the stratum vascularis we can see there. A higher magnification of it shows us the endometrium there, the stratum, the, so the myometrium, and those blood vessels with very thick walls. This is the stratum vascularis of the myometrium. So the histology of the uterus will largely depend on the physiological phase of the endometrium. There are times you may see very prominent endometrial glands, as we can see in this image. There are times you can see very few of them, depending on whether it has just been shed off or not. But importantly, remember that the endometrium is lined by a simple column epithelium. That simple column epithelium extends to the cervix. And the upper part of the cervix, which we call the endocervix, this one will still have the simple column epithelium. However, the lower part of the cervix has the same epithelium like that of the vagina. It will be stratified squamous epithelium, stratified squamous non creatinous epithelium. That means what? Ectocervix having stratified squamous non keratinous epithelium, and uh, endocervix having simple column epithelium, it means that the cervix is a site of squamocolumnar junction. This squamocolumnar junction is where we have the origin of those many pathologies uh, related to cervical cancer. All right, now while we're there, we can talk about the phases of the endometrium. So we mentioned that uh, after ovulation, there is uh, the luteal phase of the ovary. 
and that during the luteal phase, we have production of progesterone, but we mentioned that the corpus luteum does not last forever. So when the corpus luteum involutes, the levels of progesterone go down. So the first phase I want to talk about, the phase of the endometrium I want to talk about is what we call the menstrual phase. I've already told you that the corpus luteum usually involute. The corpus luteum produces hormones, but if it involutes 14 days after ovulation, it means that we are going to have reduction in the levels of ovarian hormone secretion. The reduction in the levels of ovarian hormone secretion is responsible for the menstrual phase of the endometrium. Why is that so? Usually, the ovarian hormones are the ones that sustain the integrity of the endometrium. And especially the progesterone maintains the integrity of the endometrium. So when we have ovarian hormone deficiency, the endometrial integrity is uh, compromised. And so it will disintegrate. The blood vessels of the endometrium also do not become adequate in supplying the endometrium and so the endometrium become ischemic. So what's the effect? There'll be shedding of the endometrium and that's what we call the menstrual phase. So I want you to understand that the menstrual phase is as a result of ovarian hormone deficiency. And that day where menstruation begin is considered the first day of the cycle. The flow usually lasts for about five days, plus minus two, which means maybe from three to seven. The discharge that comes out during menstrual flow will contain blood, will contain mucus, but also contain the disquamated endometrial tissue. Remember, the layer that disquamates is the stratum functionalis, the stratum basale remains. Usually, the menstrual flow does not clot in normal circumstances because it has some anticoagulants within it. After the menstrual phase, the endometrium enters what we call the proliferative phase. This proliferative phase is a period of re-epithelialization. So basically the epithelium of the endometrium regenerates itself. This coincides with the follicular phase of the ovary. So that means that we have estrogen being produced from the ovary. The estrogen hormone is the one responsible for the regeneration of the endometrium. And so the proliferative phase of the endometrium is also termed the estrogen phase. Remember I told you when we were starting that the endometrial changes are largely due to ovarian hormones. And the ovarian phases are largely due to pituitary hormones. So that's why here we are talking about estrogen and we're going to talk about progesterone as well in the next one. So look at that. During the early proliferative, sorry, during the early follicular phase and even going to the late follicular phase, the levels of estrogen rise. So as the levels of estrogen rise, we have that effect on the endometrium, making the endometrium to proliferate. And that's why we call the proliferative phase. Now, as the levels of estrogen rise, 
when the levels of estrogen reaches that peak, it has an effect on the type and amount of cervical mucus. The peak at the peak of estrogen hormone, the amount of cervical mucus is abundant. It's quite a lot. And the mucus is more elastic as well. Why is that so? Remember at the peak of estrogen secretion is around the time of ovulation because it's going to trigger that positive feedback mechanism that leads to ovulation. So we are around the time of ovulation. That means that we need the sperm possibly to move to the site of the oocyte that has been ovulated or will be ovulated shortly. So the changes in cervical mucus are important in facilitating movement of the sperm around the time of ovulation. We can therefore use this also to know one of the physical markers that a woman could be ovulating is that we can look at the change in the consistency, the texture, and the amount of the cervical mucus. A woman may be able to tell that she's ovulating based on that. After the proliferative phase, remember now in the ovary, ovulation has taken place. When ovulation takes place in the ovary, we have luteinization of the follicle. When you have luteinization of the follicle, what's going to happen is that now the ovary will start producing more progesterone as opposed to estrogen. High levels of secretion of progesterone is actually responsible for the secretory phase of the endometrium. The secretory phase of the endometrium is marked by branching and curling of endometrial glands and blood vessels. If you remember the image I showed you of how blood vessels go into the endometrium. These glands secrete glycogen rich fluid and that's why we call it secretory phase. And these changes are largely because of progesterone. Remember I told you ovulation has taken place in the ovary and so we have the corpus luteal. And so this corresponds to the luteal phase of the ovary. Therefore, it corresponds to the progesterone phase of the ovary. The secretory phase is therefore called the progesterone phase. Perhaps this graph of the hormones will make it easier for you. So menstrual phase is that period there. Then you have the, the period of the proliferative phase where the levels of estrogen rise. So we call it the estrogen phase. Ovulation takes place around that time in the ovary. And after that, we have the progesterone levels rising because of corpus luteum. And so this corresponds to the secretory phase of the endometrium. During this period, the cervical mucus is significantly reduced in amount and the mucus is also very thick and stick here. What does that mean to the poor sperms? They can swim faster. So this is ideally blocking sperm movement. So perhaps that's important to note. It also forms the basis of some contraceptives, you know, like the EPIL, the emergency contraceptive, which is usually progesterone only drug. In the presence of progesterone, the cervical mucus becomes thick and stickier. So if a woman takes that drug, the cervical mucus becomes thick and stickier, which means that the sperms can now not swim faster into that particular mucus. You can imagine how sperms swimming within porridge, they won't go far. 
Okay, so I think I'll not spend much time on this one. I've already correlated for you the ovarian phases. We talked about the follicular phase, ovulatory and luteal phase, and how that has an impact on the endometrium. During the follicular phase, we have rising levels of estrogen and that's responsible for the proliferative phase. Then ovulation takes place and then you have the luteal phase. During the luteal phase, we have rising levels of progesterone and that's responsible for the secretory phase. But as the corpus luteum involutes, the levels of progesterone go down and so the endometrium becomes ischemic and menstruation takes place. Okay. So that summarizes the story of the uterus and endometrial changes. Now we can talk about the third component of the female internal genitalia, and that's the vaginal canal. So this is the vaginal canal. Usually it's angulated somehow, about 70 degrees, 6 to 70 degrees from the horizontal plane. It extends upwards to surround the cervix. Anteriorly, we have the anterior phonics, and posteriorly, we have the posterior phonics. Those are the parts of the vagina around the cervix, anterior phonics and posterior phonics. And this is the cervix, basically, with the external host there. So anyway, this is the vagina. From outside, the vagina is more of a vertical slit, so having a right and a left wall. But as you go in, the vagina is more of a horizontal slit, and so you have an anterior and a posterior wall. That anatomy is important to capture, so that when we're inserting speculum for vagina examination, then you know how to orient the speculum initially when it's out, and once it's in, you change the position to take the orientation of the vaginal canal. So from outside, it's a vertical slit like that with right and left walls. Then from inside, it is a horizontal slit with anterior posterior wall. So this is the anterior vaginal wall, which ends to the anterior phonics, and this is the posterior vaginal wall which will end into the posterior phonics there. So what are the functions of the vagina? It's the female organ of copulation. It's also the birth canal and it's the path that is followed by menstrual flow. Histologically, this is how the vagina look like. It's lined by stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. Similar to the epithelium of the ectocervix, remember this type of epithelium is able to withstand friction. We don't have so much within the dip of the epithelial lining, we don't see glands really. It's one of the ways of distinguishing the vaginal canal from the esophagus. Okay, now let's finish with the physiology of female sexual response. So female sexual response, just like male sexual response, will have to begin sexual stimulation. However, the success of sexual stimulation relies both on psychic as well as local stimulation. Psychic to mean mental, so something in the mind of the woman and local to mean largely around the clitoris. So the success of stimulation relies on both of those. The desire to have sex in a woman varies a lot depending on the cycle. The peak for female libido is around the time of ovulation. So when a woman is stimulated, and this stimulation could be, have started much earlier, 
but then we've agreed that you have to couple psychic stimulation with local stimulation. Local stimulation could involve rubbing of the clitoris or around the vulva, the mons, things like that, massaging. Once, when a woman is stimulated, a woman responds by lubricating the vagina. This vaginal lubrication is largely a parasympathetic signal that has been activated. So it causes battling glands and perhaps other sites like the glands of the cervix to produce their mucus into the introitus. This is what lubricates the vagina. That lubrication is necessary to establish some satisfactory massaging sensation rather than irritative sensation. The point here is that if a woman is having sex or there's some penetration or rubbing there, you need adequate lubrication so that that gives a massaging sensation to the woman. Because if there is no adequate sense, uh, lubrication, any rub there will be more of irritative than massaging. A massaging sensation continue to stimulate the woman. It provides continuous stimulation. An irritative sensation may even cause a rapid cessation of the sexual desire. It can take away the sexual sensation, but that massaging sensation continue to stimulate the woman. So the lubrication is vital for success of sexual intercourse. This is because the massaging sensation usually evoke some reflexes in the woman that cause some contractions of the female reproductive tract as well as the female pelvic floor. And those contractions are important to initiate the climax for both male as well as the female. So massaging sensation is vital, both for the man and for the woman. If a woman has well lubricated and it is in the context of sexual intercourse or the stimulus is continuing, let's say so, then the woman will respond by clitoral erection. This is still parasympathetic signal doing this. Remember from male perspective, parasympathetic would cause vasodilation of penile vasculature. Same scenario happens in even the female. The rectal tissues of the clitoris undergo vasodilation. That means increased blood flow into the rectal tissues. Because of that increased blood flow into the rectal tissues, so you can imagine that the labia minora swells and that makes the region around the introitus to tighten. If the penis is inside the introitus, that means that there'll be some tightening around the penis during clitoral erection. So that tightening around the clitoris so the tightening of the introitus around the penis is vital for evoking signals that will initiate male orgasm as, even, as well as even female orgasm. All right, so understand that clitoral erection is just engorgement of the erectile tissues with blood, and because of that engorgement, there'll be some tightening around the introitus. And so if the penis is inside at that time, it will cause some tightening. Even if the penis is not inside, there'll be some tightening still. And that means that if there's already tightening before the penis enters, sometimes there will be some resistance to the end of the penis in that case. If a woman has already tightened, it might be difficult for the penis to enter at that time. 
until she become relaxed again, then now the penis can enter. Okay. If the stimulus continues, and let's assume that the penis is inside or the stimulation is going on, then the woman enters into orgasm. This is the climax of female sexual response. So what happens during the female sexual uh, during the female orgasm? Basically, it's that time when the woman is now feeling maximal intensity of the sexual stimulation. The pleasure is maximal at that time. Maybe the women would be better placed to describe that face than me. But important to note is that uh, for female orgasm to take place, the local sensations during the intercourse must be supported by the correct psychic conditioning signals. What I mean is that uh, a woman may not go into orgasm if she's not relaxed mentally. And that if she's relaxed mentally, if there's no local stimulation, again, she may not enter into orgasm. So the stimulations in the local place, which means around the clitoris and the introitus, those local stimulations must be supported with appropriate psychic conditioning. This appropriate psychic condition may even mean that uh, you started talking to the woman much earlier so that she's mentally prepared and looking forward to the occasion. Unlike male orgasm that it can happen very easily within few seconds, for female orgasm, there must be some conditioning for some time. So during female orgasm, what happens? There are some rhythmic contractions in the vagina, in the uterus, and in the muscles of the pelvic floor. As those contractions go on, at around that time, the cervix also usually dilate at that point. The dilatation of the cervix at around the time of female orgasm is aimed at allowing the sperms to pass through because the assumption here is that perhaps the man is also going into orgasm. The assumption is that the penis is inside the vagina this time. And so the man will also go into orgasm and that means that sperms will be deposited in the vagina. And so the cervix opens temporarily to allow passage of sperms at that time. Okay, that is the story of female sexual response. And that therefore summarizes our lecture on the female reproductive system. Thank you very much. We'll stop there.